verses this morning out of Psalms 103. And if you're able to stand while I read these verses, it will be a blessing. If you can't, please know that we understand. Psalms 103. I'm going to read 12 verses, but only really talk about four. Uh, but I felt it just, you know, I share with you guys so many times. When people come to the house of the Lord, I just think it's good that we read scripture. So um, sometimes I add some few verses into my text just for clarification as well as for edification. Amen. So this morning we're going to look at Psalms 103. I'm going to begin at verse number one. And um, to give, if you saw me stream live this morning from on Facebook, you heard me say that it's going to take about a month for us to get everything back running so that we're streaming live and all of that good stuff. Uh, I want to encourage you to encourage your brothers and sisters to be in the house of the Lord Amen. and come out and receive the word. We're still worshiping. We're thankful that we still have great sound and we still have a building that's standing and lights. And so we can have church. Amen. We just can't stream right now. And like I said on Tuesday, I was preaching before there was screens. And so I can preach without the screens. Uh, I want to, uh, if you, I know some of you didn't make Tuesday night, but those that was here, man, let's thank the Lord for Vicki. She shared a great word on Tuesday night. And and I really want y'all to help me celebrate Anthony George Cousin, who drove up from Gainesville today to have service with us. He drove from Gainesville, right? He beat Anthony here, so I'm just, that's all I'm going to say. That's all I'm going to say. I love him, but I said he drove from another city, and he beat you here. I'm just playing. Uh, Destiny and her boyfriend are here hanging out from college. I love Destiny. And uh, and Calvin looked like he has his grandchildren and, and, and some of his family with him. Some of y'all, right? Let's thank the Lord for Calvin and his family. Live your babies, yeah. And everybody else that's visiting, I can't start calling people names. Don't get mad at me. I want to leave you four things today. My wife and I have to get on the road right after service, and, and, and so I, gotta, I want to share these four things with you and leave these four things with you today. Amen. Uh, Psalms 103, beginning at verse 1. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits who forgiveth all thine iniquity, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercy, who satisfies thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like eagles. The Lord executed righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. He made known his ways unto Moses, his acts unto the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious. Whew, these, these, my, these my verses I'm reading right, verse beginning. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities for as the heaven is higher up high above the earth so great is his mercy towards them that fear him my last verse as far as the east is from the west so far has he removed our transgressions from us and the people of God shouted amen, amen. come on amen again I want to talk to us for a few minutes from the subject, a father's heart, a father's heart. You can be seated in the presence of the Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you. Throughout the past few weeks, I have um, engaged in conversations with other believers, uh, with other pastors, uh, and with others who, who, who named the name of Christ as their Lord. My conversation has been very pointed and direct 
because I have some concerns about what it means to be a modern day Christian, living in this dispensation, if you will. What it doesn't mean for Christians and how we ought to live and how we ought to be followers of Christ. What, what does that look like for us? What, what guides us? What governs us? What are those parameters that are so needed? In one of my conversations which, uh, during this past week, I was reminded about an example that I used some time ago. I can't even remember when, but when, the, when he spoke it to me, Elder Ricky spoke it to me, it just, it, it just brought back such memories. I remember talking about there was this pastor who had a glass that was filled with water and the pastor set up all kinds of obstacles, if you will, in front of the person who had the glass of water, who was holding the glass of water. The person was on one end, they had obstacles and then they had a finish line, if you will, that they had to get to. In order for them to make sure that they do not spill any of the water, the individual had to focus on the glass and not on the obstacles. And so that, that, that very saying began to just bring life to me. It, be, it began to help me to process why I began to have concerns in the first place. Because the Bible teaches us that we ought to keep our eyes on Jesus and on God. But sometimes, if we'll be honest, it's, it's hard not to see others. It's hard not to see others and how they are living and what they are doing. But I can... I begin to think about how much I consider myself, and this might just be me, I consider myself to be a biblicist, a man who lives and governs his life according to the scriptures. I, I know that everybody are in, they are in different places with this, but I really, um, standing today, try to govern my life according to the scriptures. And when you are called to be a preacher of righteousness, watch me, sometimes we can try to impose our convictions on others. We can try to make people see things and try to make people line up and live according to something. And whenever this happens, we need to be reminded, as I was this past week, I was reminded that my focus needs to be on God and not necessarily on what other people are doing. Stay focused on what God has called you to do. This also is seen in the scriptures when we see the prophet Elijah who is struggling in his own walk, in his assignment. He has just um, slaughtered 450 prophets of Baal, and Elijah finds himself running from Jezebel in, in the wilderness and wants to commit suicide, according to the text. He wants to commit suicide. He's tired of this. And we find in 1 Kings 19 and 14 these words that Elijah cries out to God. And I want you to really pay attention to the verbiage of the first sentence. He, he says, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts. Listen to that. Because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant. They've thrown down thine altars and slain thy prophets with the sword. Watch, watch his complaint. I, even I, only am left and they seek my life to take it away also. And if you read the text, and you can read it later on at your leisure, you will begin to see how God, in his love, corrects his son. He corrects Elijah. He corrects him. He, he says, listen, listen, son, I, I got 7,000 folk who've never bowed their knee to Baal nor kissed at him. In other words, I'm good. You need to stay focused on what I've called you to do. Get up. Go anoint Elisha for the next prophet. He's going to take your place. There's still work that needs to be done while you're sitting here complaining about what other people are doing. God, in his love, correct him. And correction is a part of the love that the Father has for us. Listen to Hebrews, the 12th chapter, verse number 6 from the New Living. It says, for the Lord disciplines those he loves, and he punishes each one he accepts as child. As you endure this divine discipline, I love the way the New Living puts that, this divine discipline, remember that God is treating you as his own children. Who ever heard of a child who, never, who is never disciplined by his father? If God doesn't discipline you as he does all of his children, it means that you're illegitimate. 
and not really his children. Since we respect, verse 9, since we respected our earthly fathers who disciplined us, shouldn't we submit even more to the discipline of the father of our spirit and live forever? Isn't that just like a father to lovingly correct his children? And as we sit here today, I begin to think about how many of us maybe had no example in the natural of what it means to be a father. And have a father in the house. If you were like me, you didn't grow up with a father in the home. My father was not in the home with me. My mother raised us, all four of her kids, by herself. So didn't have no examples in the natural. And, and when you don't have any example in the natural, I need you to understand this. If you are a follower of Christ, if you are a Christian, a child of God, if you have no example in the natural, you can always pull on your example of your heavenly father. You can't let not having anyone around you to model for you or whatever stop you. Because we have a heavenly father and his character is spelled out in the scriptures. How many in this room today are thankful that you have a heavenly father? Just, I was so blessed to hear Tawana sing that song. I haven't heard her sing in a while, and that's one of my favorite songs for her to sing. That's why I made him sing it again. Sometimes it's good to be the pastor. Like, no, just, I just, let's take it to the top. Take it to the top. I know yeah, we got other stuff to do, but I need to hear those verses. I was in the back getting dressed, about to stumble, fall all over myself, trying to get out of here, because I heard that chorus. I said, oh, no. <laughs> get ready. I love to hear her sing that song. I mean, I just love it. I just love it. And so, but you know, being, pulling the pastor card, you can do some stuff. But let me give you a vision of a of a of father, the father's love, and I and I want you to see yourself in this example. I want you to see yourself in this. At the 1992 Olympics in Barcelona, Spain, the world watched as the parable of the father's love was played out on international television. As the gun sounded for the 400 meter race, Great Britain's Derek Redmond knew that his lifelong dream of winning a gold medal was right within his grasp, right in his view. But as he entered the back stretch, Redmond was sent sprawling. He fell to the ground with a torn handspring. By, by an act of sheer will, he struggled up on his feet, dealing with excruciating pain, and began hopping towards the finish line. Suddenly, Derek's father jumps out of the stands, run past the security guards, and threw his arms around his son. And in a voice choked with emotion, he whispered in his son's ear, Come on, son, let's finish this together. The crowd cheered. People watched as the father carried his wounded son down the final stretch and across the finish line. This, my brothers and sisters, is a great example of the father's love for us. I know that I am not the only one in this room with testimonies of those times in your life where pain has stopped you, hit you, struck you, something has happened, and then out of nowhere, your father, who loves you dearly, crosses through stands and security, doesn't care. He breaks through barriers. Come on, y'all playing with it. He breaks through barriers to come and rescue you and say, come on. And I want to say it in the force of the Father today, and I need you to praise him for it. Come on, let's finish this together. Come on, let's, let's, let's press on. I know you got some problems. I know you got some issues. I'm going to preach over here. I know things don't look great. I know it's challenging. But I'm going to go over here, and I know you don't understand some stuff, but is there anybody else besides me that's grateful that God will come alongside of you and help you to finish together? I love that. He loves me. I've been preaching that for the past few weeks. He loves me. Today, we want to take the time to honor fathers. We want to take the time and to celebrate them. And, and I know that we've already done it, but can we do one more time? Let's thank God for the fathers of this great house. 
Come on. A little longer. Come on. A little louder. A little louder. Come on. Thank God for them. It's a great thing to be a father. And so since today was Father's Day, I couldn't think of a more outstanding example of a father than our Heavenly Father. And can I tell you something even more amazing? An infinite, perfectly holy, majestic, awesome God is passionately in love with insignificant, sinful, sometimes openly rebellious, frequently indifferent, people okay I know some of y'all missed that so I'm going to say it again I want to tell you one more amazing thing and if I hit you just go ahead and shout an infinite perfectly holy majestic awesome God is passionately in love with insignificant, sinful, sometimes openly rebellious, frequently indifferent people. God loves people like you and me. Come on, take your seats. In fact, God loves us so much, he wants to adopt us into his family. He wants to adopt us into his family. And even beyond that, he wants us to call him father. He wants us to call him father. Now, the Bible doesn't teach us that everybody becomes a child of God automatically. We are, come on, by the grace of God and the finished work of Christ, we are adopted into the family of God. We are adopted. How many here today are children of the most high? Look at them hands. Look at those hands. Some of them not looking at hands. Look at their phones. But look at their hands. <laughs> but it's in our text today, Psalms 103 and 8, since our Heavenly Father is the example that I want to leave with us today, I want to pull out four different characteristics, if you will, because when it comes to the, his love, God's love, watch me, for the sinful, God has a long fuse, short memory, thick skin, and a big heart. Listen to verse 8 from the New Living. The Lord is compassionate and merciful, slow to get angry, and filled with unfailing love. He, listen, God has a long fuse. And in the text David is writing, this is actually a quote from something that Moses had written some 500 years earlier. Most of us, if you have any tenure in the church, are familiar with this. And there are other, many other people who quote this, um, that is, this verse about him being long, um, short with anger and all that. We've, we, many other people quote it. It, it. it comes directly from Exodus, the 24th chapter. I want to paint a picture for those who don't know. Because while Moses, the man of God, is on the top of Mount Sinai, receiving instructions from the Lord. He's gone for 40 days. Joshua, his servant, is nearby. He's, he's up there conferring with God, getting the next plan, the next step for the people of God. He's gone for 40 days, and while Moses is up talking to God about the people of God, the people of God are having a party. Having a party. The, the same people that God just delivered from bondage, just rescued out of Egypt, just freed them, they chose to express their gratitude to God by worshiping an idol. They just began to worship an idol. Not only did they worship an idol, there was drunkenness and all kinds of immorality going on. Now, so the scripture says that when God saw this, listen to this, God told Moses, step back, I'm going to kill all of them. Kill every last one of them. And I'll start a new nation with you, Moses. Moses, being the good pastor that he is, he fell on his face and pleaded to God. And God, watch this, agrees with Moses and he restrains his righteous wrath. But he said, I tell you what, I'm not going to kill him, but I ain't going to go with you any further. You're going to be on your own. And then Moses cries out again. 
He says, God, please don't leave us out here. Let the people say that you were not able to deliver us or bring us into the promised land. And so what does God do? Amazingly, amazingly, God decides to still go with them. Yes, God, and I need you to understand, when it comes, I'm going to say it again, when it comes to God's love for the sinful people, God has a long fuse, he has a short memory, a thick skin, and a big heart. Yes, God gets angry, but God puts up with a great deal before reaching his boiling point. Over and over again, the Bible tells us the reason that God exercises such patience, he is hoping that we will take advantage of his grace, take advantage of his love and compassion and turn back to him and begin to follow him and obey him. He's hoping that he that we'll just come to our senses and say, you know what? I need to get my life together. I need to get this thing on track. God hasn't killed me. I'm going to give you 30 seconds. That because God has not killed you in your mess. Let me try that again. I, I want to find the people that you know your life was jacked up, tore up from the floor up, and you know you was wrong. You know you did it. 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 Wait, wait a minute. You know you're doing it. You know you're doing it. You know you're doing it. And God has not killed you yet. 30 more seconds. Make the devil real mad and praise you. God didn't kill you for what you did last night. He didn't kill you for what you did last week. He didn't kill you for how you acted the other day. And if you're in the house of the Lord, you ain't got to sit down and look pretty. Don't you worry about nobody else. You got to stand for God for yourself. Don't worry about nobody else. If the Lord has ever extended his mercy towards you, here's your opportunity. Make a joyful noise and bless his holy He extends his grace in the hopes that we will turn from our wretchedness and run back to him. Run back to him. But instead, most of us make the mistaken assumption that God's patience really means that he's not concerned about our disobedience. And so we abuse his grace. I want to help you here today. You're hearing the word now. You're going, to, you're going to have to respond to the word. The reason God hasn't killed you yet is because he's extended grace. He's trying to help you to get it right. So if you're in here today, today is the day to get it right. You don't have to go another day in your sins. You can turn to God. Receive of his love and be adopted into his family. Every one of us in this room, watch me, because we were just shouting a few minutes ago, can learn from this example. God has been very patient with us. Did you hear me, Vic? You don't have, nobody has to get deep and prophetic this month. Right here, right here. Nobody's got to get deep and spiritual and try to look through your past and see your grandmama purple house living on 8th Street. You know in your own self, with your own self, as crazy as you are, how many people can thank God he's been patient with you? He's been patient with you, man. We haven't done it right. Come on. We haven't made all the right choices. I'm talking about, and listen, I ain't talking about before salvation. I need some folk who be honest since salvation. He, he's been patient with me. Come on, I wish I was about, I had to the fool last week. He didn't kill me. He's been patient with me. And, 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 and if we are recipients of that, if we are recipients of that patience, how much more should we extend it to others? How much more should we extend patience to others when God has been patient with us? 
Here's my next point. Can I keep moving out? I, I can stay there for a minute. But here's the next one. God doesn't bring up what we've done. Listen to verse Psalms 103 and 9 from the New Living. He will not constantly accuse us nor remain angry forever. All right? He doesn't keep bringing up what we've done. I want you to listen to this little quick story. <clears throat> Maybe the fathers can relate. I don't know. But a guy complained to his buddy that whenever he argues with his wife, he says, my wife gets historical. And his friends say, don't you mean hysterical? He says, no, historical. <laughs> she dredges up the past and reminds me of every time I've ever failed her. You don't have to look because she's sitting next to you. Maybe your wife gets a little historical whenever you mess up. <laughs> but God, our Heavenly Father, See, y'all want me to skate over there because y'all don't, don't want me to start nothing. Just keep moving. Don't start talking. Well, you know, you did this last year. You did this last week. Yeah, so. <laughs> but how many in here grateful that God chooses to have a short memory? <laughs> y'all going to make me shout and run around here this morning. I, I'm thankful. Right? Listen to Psalms. 133. and 3. I want you to listen to it. These are verses that I wish we had to screen for, just so you can read it. Because I want you to, but listen to it. Psalms 130 and 3. Lord, if you kept a record of our sins, who, oh Lord, could ever survive? If the Lord kept a record of all of your sins. Who in this room would ever survive? Okay, listen to Psalms 57 and 16. This is God speaking. For I will not fight against you forever. I will not always be angry. If I were, if I were, all the people would pass away. And all, all the souls that I have made. He, he, he listen to this. God says, if I keep throwing up in your face all of your past failures, if I choose to retain an angry disposition towards you because of your sins, your spirit within you would just grow faint before me and you would wither up and just die. Do you hear this? I, God says, if I keep telling you about that hole you slept with again and again and again and again and all the times you drunk and all the times you lied and all the times you did manipulated and all the times you did all of this stuff, your soul would just get weak. And I'm going to tell you right now, it's a great place to thank the Lord that he has a short memory. Y'all playing with it. You already know what you did. Can you imagine this? They go before God and say, Father, I did it again. I just want you to picture this. Father, I did it again. Oh, please cleanse me, Father, of my sins and give me strength. And could you imagine if this was God's resp response? He did it again. That's putting it rather mildly. This is the fifth time you've done it this week. What if God said, I stopped forgiving that 50? Did you hear me? What if, what if God says, I'm, I'm finished forgiving you for that at 50? It's over with. But thanks goodness. And I know it sounds comical. Because I want you to really catch the fullness of it. Thank goodness, once I've sought God's forgiveness, he doesn't keep reminding me. He doesn't keep harboring anger towards me. He chooses to have a short memory uh, for, for stuff. Now don't act like I'm the only one who has asked God to forgive you for the same thing. 
Look around. Look, come on. Don't, 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 don't play me like that. That, that. There are so many of us in here today who can thank God that he's forgiven us for the same thing. You keep falling in it. You keep messing over. You keep dropping the ball. But how many of you here grateful today that God has a short memory and that he doesn't throw it back up in your face? He doesn't say you did that last year. He doesn't say you did that last week. He doesn't say that you just did it last night. If you are faithful and just to confess your sin, the Bible says God will forgive you. So don't tell me, I'm going to preach to E, don't tell me we don't need this example. Because when people do us wrong, one time, we, yeah, every time we're going to cut them off. <laughs> Watch me. Yeah, I'm going to go over here and talk to Juana. I don't think he might, he might be off right. <laughs> if, 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 if God... If people do us wrong one time, we may give them a little grace. But if it happens again, and then it happens again, and then it happens again, all right, right? Don't, don't look holy now. Try to look holy now. I, I, I'm only bringing this up because of my struggle for this week. Because I am thankful. Because even Jesus said that if your brother sins against you, you ought to forgive him seven times 70. Watch this in the same day for the same thing. This is hard to do. Y'all playing with it. Okay. This, this is hard to do. Because you know, we ain't made like that. You cross me one time, two times, maybe three times. I'm like, oh, no, you out. But today, I want the Father, his love that he shows me because there's not a one of us in here today that can act like God hasn't forgiven us for the same thing. If you are, you're lying. I, I know because we're human. We're flesh. There's not a one of us in here that have not stood up under that same grace that said, God, here I am again. So... Can you make the devil real mad if God has ever forgiven you for the same thing and he has short mercy? Can you give your father, your heavenly father, a great big praise and thank you? The same thing. Yeah. God chooses to have a short memory. I want you to think about that the next time somebody does something wrong to you. And I have many more verses that I can tie to this. Believe me, I do. I want you to remember this the next time somebody does something to you and it's the same thing. I want you to remember the first point that God is patient. And then I want you to remember this, that he doesn't keep bringing up for people what we've done. Right. Here's my third one. This is probably a real big one. God doesn't punish us. He doesn't punish us for what we deserve. He doesn't punish us for what we do. Psalms 103 and 10, he does not punish us for all of our sins. He does, he does not deal harshly with us as we deserve. Let's be real. If God punished us every time we deserved it <laughs> we would be in a perpetual state of receiving retribution it'd be like bam yes father bam. bam every time because we are but flesh we would be chastened by god watch this for our, maybe our selfish attitude hurtful words prideful spirit materialism come on man indifference to towards people who have need the bible word for god's thick skin is called forbearance he he bears all of that there's a lot of things that god can never bring up that he does never bring up because he's chosen to ignore them here's the scripture are you ready love covers a multitude 
of sin. Scripture says that God doesn't always treat us as our sins deserve. He doesn't give us what we think. You know, he doesn't give us what we deserve, rather. And for that, we ought to always be grateful. People often ask me, how do I just love people? Because the reason I just love people is because I think about how God loves me. God has a long fuse, short memory, and he has thick skin. How many in this room know we need to learn how to have some forbearance in our life? The enemy works in all of this stuff to destroy us and to try to deceive us. But today, I want to try to allow these characteristics of the heavenly father to come alive in my life. Now, I want you to really to understand, because though I've been quite comical throughout the message to try to make the medicine go down real good, I need you to understand there's still no excuse for those of us who are now Christians as to why we can't live up to this standard. Because of Christ, what the finished work of Christ states to us that we are now have power. The Holy Spirit, Ephesians 3 said that we ought to be strengthened in the inner man. Some of us feel like we can't forgive for the same thing over and over and over again. But I'm grateful. If you trust in the Father, God will walk you through that. Here's my fourth one, and then I'm almost done. God doesn't remember what we've done. You see, Psalms 103 and 11 says, For his unfailing love towards us, those who fear him, is great as the height of the heaven above the earth. Verse 12 says, He removes our sins as far as from the east is from the west. The psalmist tells us that, that when we ask God to forgive us of our sin, he removes them as far as the east is from the west. And do you really realize how far this is? And truth is, it, it, you can't even measure it. Because if you start here and keep going east, when do we run into west? Never. God's love, he casts our sins far away. And if you ever wondered how serious God is about taking care of our sins, he has all sorts of metaphors that are laced throughout the canon that would help us hear, hear a few verses. Micah 7 and 19 says, he will trample it underfoot and throw it into the deepest parts of the sea. Isaiah 38 and 17 says he'll put it behind his back where he can't even see it. Isaiah 43 and 25 says he'll blot out our transgressions. Isaiah 44 and 22 says he'll sweep it all away just like the morning mist that gets burnt off by the sun. Jeremiah 31 and 34 says God will refuse to remember it. He'll just block it out of his memory. That's the kind of forgiveness we need to extend to one another. So in closing today, help me, Marcus, I'm done. This week I was just reminded, I told you I preached from my experience, I was just reminded that I need to keep my eyes on what God has called me to do. I want you to stand with me for just for a minute. Watch this. And I want to share this with you, that in this season, so much stuff is going on, so many things are happening. I, I want to encourage you to keep your eyes on what the Father has called you to do. Don't worry about what other people are doing or what other people are even saying. Come on, raise your hands high as you can get them. I want you to receive the wisdom, the strength, the anointing to keep your eyes focused on what God has called you to do. Other people can be a distraction. Other stuff can be a distraction. But keep your eyes on what God has called you to do. I'm going to ask Vicky if you sing a little bit of that song again for me. Watch me, everybody. Here's the, here, here I go again. I told my wife this. Watch me. I told my wife this last night. We was writing, and I'm saying, you know, I've got to do better because we have to learn to process life through the scriptures. You understand that? You process life through the scriptures. How do you process life through the scriptures? You, you make every decision centered around what the scripture says. And I want you to reflect on the Heavenly Father, how he responds to us, right? We went through four different things. God is patient with us. God doesn't 
God doesn't keep bringing up what we've done. God doesn't punish us for what we've deserved. God doesn't remember what we've done. What I love about the book of Psalms is that, watch me, it teaches me how to relate to God. And in the same breath of me learning how to relate to God, I get a chance to learn how to relate to each other, one another, and I'm strengthening my walk with God. My relationship with God, watch me, don't, don't worry about that, watch me. My relationship with God and my wife, my wife and our relationship with God, I should say, has been what has kept us in this season. We have been living in a really weird season, if you will, where we are seeing the blessings and the powerful move of God, all the while still suffering loss and dealing with attacks all kinds of places. And, I, and I'm trying to keep my mind focused on God and on my assignment. And I think that's what, he, when Rick and I was talking about it, I think that just really shifted my thinking. That just focus on carrying that water. And if you focus on not spilling that water, you won't pay attention to everything else that's going on around you. You know, my mother passed <clears throat> and went, on, went home to be with the Lord on March the 5th of this year and since that day it seemingly I've suffered loss after loss after loss and it just seemed like it has been sometimes just crazy overbearing on Tuesday night just before Vicky shared the word of the Lord I'm standing in the hall right here in the, down the aisle and my brother calls me and says my mother's sister has just been admitted into hospice and then on Friday just before the game night he calls me and says she's gone home to be with the Lord and so, I, you know, I, I had to process this, that I got to go and take care of my family, be a part of what I can do and serve. And then last night, you know, just a few weeks ago, we stood at a funeral with my wife's grandmother who passed. And I saw her brother, my wife's brother, Matt, come up and he gave scriptures and read scriptures. And some of you might remember, but Matt's wife went in after the funeral. This has only been a couple of weeks ago. Went in to do a simple procedure. And last night, it pronounced her brain dead. And so my wife and I, we're getting on the road right out to here to ride out the service to go ride down to Cocoa Beach and try to be with her brother and try to see what service, how we can help serve. And my wife, who is an oncologist nurse, master degree oncologist nurse, is going to go and try to answer some of these questions that the doctor have. I say that to say this, that life will come at you fast and things will happen that are beyond your control. But your relationship with the Father yes, will keep you rooted and grounded in Him. Yes, Watch me before you clap so you can still do what you're called to do. Right. Still do what you're called to do. Your emotions should never control your life, no matter the tears. And that's come when that song says, He's a good, good Father, why it ministers to me because He loves me. He's a good, good father. And I shared to my wife, you have to always understand this. The theological term that talks about God is still righteous and desert and sovereign, even in the face of human tragedy. That theodicy, you have to still understand that even though bad things happen, it does not undo the sovereignty of our God. And so watch this, every one of us, it is appointed unto man, the scripture says, wants to die. Which means we are all going to leave this planet. Some are going to leave brutally. Some will go to sleep in their, go home with the Lord in their sleep. But it doesn't matter. We all have to leave here. And for those of us that are left here, we've got to have a right understanding of who God is and can't get mad at God and can't get upset at God and walk away from our assignment. We've got to stand flat-footed and testify. Yes, the Lord took her. Yes, God did this, but he's still good. My mama's in heaven, and I'm going to see her one day, and I'm going to praise the Lord until then. You can't throw in the towel. I can't have a, a pity party. I can't have a depression party. I can't. There's still too much work that needs to be done. And how many of you know, there's still people who need to know who Jesus is. And if the church runs away because life is difficult, then no one will ever come to him. But I need about 55 people in here that can give your God a praise because he is still good. He's still God. He's still worthy. Nothing else, nothing else, nothing else would do 
Nothing else will do. Nothing else. Come on, just a little bit of this. Come on. I just want you. And nothing else. Nothing else. Nothing else. Oh. 